Good evening and welcome to our second ever Flux Live centred around audiovisual performance. My name is Afra Shemza and I'm a curator and co-founder of Art in Flux and of course an artist myself. I'm a multimedia artist working with light, abstraction and interactivity. I combine traditional sculpting techniques with the latest technology to create my pieces. This evening, however, I am your curator, but before we get started introducing our exceptional new media talents, I'll introduce you now to Oliver Gingrich and Maria Almina, my co-hosts, who will tell you a little bit about Art in Flux. Thank you very much for the introduction, Afro. My name is Oliver Gingrich. I am one of the three co-founders of Art in Flux. Just a couple of words about myself before I introduce Art in Flux to you. Um, I'm a researcher, an artist, and also part of the art collective Analemma Group. We've been working together for about 13 years of visual sound sculptures um, with Analemma Group, mostly participatory and immersive art pieces. My own art practice is really focused on brainwave art, working with holograms, um, and concentrating on this idea of presence. How can we make imperceivable phenomena um, perceivable and, exper um, and experience them? Um, yeah, so with that, I'm going to talk you a little bit through what we want to do um, with Art and Flex and what we have been doing for the last four years. So um, Art and Flex was created by Afra Shemza, Maria Almena and myself um, four years ago, um, initially at the Lights of Soho Gallery in London, um, out of this need to create a home for the media arts community in London. Um, we really felt that there was an institutional void, an institutional lack, and we wanted to fill this gap um, with creating a forum for discussion, um, for experimentation, for mutual support among artists. So we are an artist-led charity, and we're working with a wide variety of different artists across lots of different art forms. We're all working with various different media. New technology is very much at the core um, of what our artists are working with, and here you can see a selection of the many, many fantastic artists that we've been working with over the years. As part of what we do um, at Art and Flux, we are organizing talks, both public facing talks for the wider public, but also talks from artists for artists. So we're discussing our practice, we're, we're discussing um, what we're working on, the ideas, the concepts, um, but also um, sometimes very practical questions. Um, and we have these more public facing talks um, in collaboration with our partners, um, for instance, this year with the National Gallery. Um, we're also organizing exhibitions. Um, we were very lucky last year to have been partnering with the Computer Art Society, EVA London, um, Lumen Art Prize and um, the Royal College of Art on Event 2, which um, was the 50 year anniversary exhibition for the Computer Art Society, where we curated a contemporary art section with Art and Flux. Um, but we're also doing workshops um, and these kind of more public facing exhibitions. And we have been doing this very successfully for the last years. Um, yeah, and with that, um, just a quick overview of the different partners that we've been working with um, from Royal Borough of Kenton and Chelsea, where we've done um, more community uh, arts projects to the VNA, to Art Futura, to the Computer Art Society, and our many, many partners. Um, now, this year, we're taking this work um, into the online realm, and I'm going to hand over to Maria Almena to talk you through um, this aspect of our work. Thank you very much, Oliver. It is uh, an honor to be here presenting our next um, live event. 
My name is Maria Almena. I'm also one of the uh, co-founders at Art in Flux. I am a multidisciplinary artist and creative director of the studio Kimatica, where I explore the intersection between interactive technology, live performance, and the human form in order to create transcendental immersive experiences. You can see some images of my work on the slides. I'm going to talk you through uh, briefly our uh, virtual program. Um, this year, as uh, most of you know, we have to, we've been forced to cancel all our physical events and go into the uh, online realm to uh, provide events for all our audiences. We were awarded with the uh, Arts Council Emergency Funding, which have allowed us to keep continuing uh, our, our events. We uh, have, um, we still have our social uh, flags which are, have been always key for uh, our organizations as these internal events, they provide a platform for artists to discuss with other artists uh, different ideas, um, different uh, problems and, and we, uh, in these uh, type of events, everyone have a, a moment to um, express what they're doing and express any questions or any inquiry they might have. So these, uh, these type of events are very, very important and we have the next one is going to be curated um, by Oliver. He will tell you more about it at the end, uh, at the end of the event. Um, the next type of events of our virtual events are Flex Lives, which you, you are about to enjoy one uh, curated by uh, Afra Shemsa. Um, this is a new type of event as we were feeling we wanted to uh, represent the live essence of our physical events into a live format. We had our first ever event um, curated by Oliver Gingrich uh, last uh, month, inspired on the uh, new uh, heritage. And these live events, they basically feature uh, live shows, um, live conversations. And we also give the opportunity to the audience to, um, to have a QA and a or, or ask questions in, in the chat. The third type of event we, we are going to be hosting this year are our curated talks with our resident, the, uh, residency at the National Gallery. We already have our first event with this, that it was a focus about uh, gender, and it was curated by Oliver uh, Gingrich. Um, the second event is going to be curated by myself. It's called Levitations, and it's going to be focused about well-being and new media arts. Um, and the third event is, is called Shifting Ground, uh, is going to be curated by Afro Shevma and is happening in November. So stay um, in the loop uh, for the news and the invitations for these upcoming events. Um, now I would love to pass it over to Afra Shemsa, who is going to delight us and inspire us with some amazing um, audiovisual shows that she got prepared for us. Enjoy! Thank you both so much for providing key insights into Art in Flux. It is such a pleasure and honour to work alongside you. So, on with tonight's programme. Flux have always championed live media performance because we feel it is integral to a new media art discourse. Tonight, I'm delighted to welcome three exceptional audiovisual performers that combine sound, visuals, and technology to create their work. Performance artist Anna Nazo will present Flame 2.0, involving spoken word poetry, co-written with AI, sound and imagery that are computer generated from the artist's brainwave data, and drone performance. Transmedia artist and performer Mowgli will showcase Eye of the Beholder, an improvised audio-visual performance with analog audio and real-time generative compositions. Mark Pilkington, composer and performer of electroacoustic music, will feature two audio-visual works, Synergies and Bug Data. His works extend spatial imaginings between real and virtual environments. So without further ado, I'll introduce our first performer, Anna Nazo. Anna Nazo is a London-based performance artist whose practice engages computing technologies, philosophies and science. Within live, digital, physical, audiovisual performance, Anna's work investigates questions of intelligence diversity and ethics of the technological. Anna has exhibited and performed in the UK and internationally. Highlights include VNA Digital Futures, Ars Electronica Festival, Austria, Museum of Contemporary Art Helsinki and Somerset House. For tonight's performance, Anna presents Flame 2.0. Flame 2.0 is a Zoom 360 digital physical AV performance presented by the artist's avatar, Alpha Phoenix's Ankar. 
The work involves spoken word poetry co-written with AI, sound and imagery that are computer generated in real time from artist brainwave data and drone performance. The piece will last for 10 minutes, after which there'll be a 20 minute interview between myself and the artist. If you have any questions for Anna, please write them in the YouTube chat and she'll be able to respond to you live. Atomic Slade, Viridian, Doomed Gaze, Artificial Grief, Zero One Spell, Haunting, Virtual Fear, Opaque, Pulsating, Bleeding Edge, Deep Nest Stellar Limb Transpiring Pubit Grasping Disentangled State Multiverse Dive Virtual Slum Sinking Powder Dispersed Ultrasonic winds, probability shell, spinal trap, shifted perception, transferable.
genetic drug. Inhale. Fainting. Shock. Smooth. Turkey's gloom. Bottomless chasm. Time falls. Nuclear rookery. Hypnotic gap. Quivering. Pastel subconscious. Vision disorder. Velvet malachite. Radioactive injection. Slimish void. Trembling. Sulfuric spasm. Digital thirst. Suffocation. Streaming from the shade. Cyclic myth. Ghosting. Bleak. Emerald. Electromagnetic waves. Artificial. Melted self. Carved on hard cells. Disembodied. Chimeric system. Synthetic compound. Myrtle green cortex. Phasing. Siloxane. Penetrating rhythm. Floating derivatives. Electrifying shot. Eight petaled. Bloodstream. Wireless tentacles. Purple. Chemical wounds. Boolean synthesis. Indigo wrists. Tendril. Red slime. Sulfuric sweat. Pulsating. Crimson. Crystallized flesh. Burning deep. Repulsive. Tender. Digital ooze. Azul mire. Swollen veins. Blade. Emerald cut. Liquefied. Distributed pain. Eye. Bleeding amethysts. Deafening. Mute scream. Tickling brain. Through the nostrils. Flame 2.0 is presented by your avatar, Alpha, Phoenixes, and Car. Can you tell me about your avatar, how it came to be, and if you present all your works as the same avatar or have multiple characters? Uh, thanks for the question. Um, actually, like this specific avatar was part of um, the performance that I did for uh, Entanglement Just Gaming event. Um, at the RCA, it was part of Research Lab um, entanglement, um, which I'm proud of at the Royal College of Art. And 
kind of the idea was to create to kind of break this notion of um, kind of flatness uh, within the Zoomiverse, I would say. And so uh, we all decided that we'll be using different avatars as the same, our real names. Uh, and kind of we'll be entering Zoom twice um, as one person and as avatar from different devices. So it will be kind of multiplicity of selves uh, move uh, around the event itself. So we would have like this uh, double self, actual selves, and each of them still referring to the same physical person would be doing different things. You're using a huge variety of different technologies within your pieces, and I'd just like to address um, each aspect that you use over the next few questions to get a bit of a grasp on how the technologies themselves work and why you choose to use them, use them within your performances. So I'm particularly interested in the phrases that you use in your spoken word poetry throughout, which seem to add to the overall feeling of shifting perceptions and multiple points of view. Words such as bottomless chasm, time folds and digital thirst come up in the performance. Can you tell us a bit about how the poetry is co-written with AI and what this has to do with queer relationships in the digital? Um. Thanks. It's a big question. <laughs> Many parts to it. I can um, kind of feel like pick up like on the last part of it at first. Uh, so I started to, um, yeah, as I mentioned earlier, uh, kind of initially I started to work with just like brainwave CGI and movement itself. And then at the later stage, um, actually the next kind of element that came to my work with uh, AI poetry. So uh, approximately like three years ago or so when I kind of started to doing my PhD, I started to work with AI and I was feeding it with all my kind of personal poetry and personal writings like diaries and kind of with my PhD writing as well. And uh, kind of before each performance, I get to generate uh, some kind of text based on kind of analysis. It's quite straightforward analysis of the work and it's like open source AI, which everyone can use. Um, I think it's available as like deep writing or something like this, like online. Um, and um, so, yeah, as I mentioned, it uses quite straightforward analysis of uh, kind of my writing patterns and which uh, the words that I'm used more often and in which combinations. Uh, and then it kind of gives me back this kind of text, uh, which it generates uh, kind of using all this kind of data and patterns in, in mind, in its own artificial mind. Um, and um, it may not uh, have that much sense, uh, make sense for anybody else's, but kind of for me personally, because it's kind of, it's the words that I'm using and kind of behind them, they will move in uh, the centrous patterns and certain types of traumas and memories. Um, so it's kind of this process of co-writing and just like reading something that comes back to me, which is analyzed by a kind of, let's say another entity. I uh, operate more or less like almost like constantly, you know, like the psychological centrous feedback loops, as I call it. Um, and working with this text further, as I'm not using it as it comes from uh, AI, that is why I use it like as co-writing. So it's not just like the work created by AI solely. Um, so I kind of reflect on certain phrases uh, that um, either new to me or which kind of, kind of literally touch something inside of me. Um, and um, kind of, yeah, I, I add to them, I guess, just a little more sensitivity, color, and a kind of reflection uh, in relation to um, either my current state or in relation to the theme of the event for which if I'm commissioned to do performance. Um, so it's kind of becomes this um, overlaid um, kind of poetics, I guess, like quite multidimensional folded in different ways. And also when I'm reciting this um, live during the performances, uh, it uh, immediately triggers uh, kind of all this, as I mentioned, like memories, trauma, etc., uh, which comes just with word itself. Uh, and uh, usually the audience can see it immediately as a response um, in uh, the form of like brainwave, brainwave CGI, which uses EJ data. Uh, kind of, which is electrical activity on sign brain and picks up all kind of emotional changes. But I mean, it's, it's 
not as straightforward so you don't say like oh if you if you said that it will show this if you have it will show this because it literally reads all the activity that happens in the body so it's also kind of response to movement if you happy if you if you said if you're hungry <laughs> if you just have some kind of i don't know pain or anything so it will fix up everything uh, but yeah, like for some words, it gets really quite quite strong and immediate response. Wanted to talk a bit about that EEG headset and how this works. So we've spoken about how the the poet poetry, the poetic words, kind of come back to you, and that may alter your state in your brain, in your body, whether you move, etc. But can you explain a little bit about how the EEG works and within the performance, which parts of the animations in the video are being controlled by your brainwave data? Mm. Um, kind of literally like how it works, like let's start like maybe from like very technical bit. So I'm using a NeuroSky EEG headset, uh, which is quite kind of, I don't know, basic type of headsets, but it just does the job. <laughs> and this is something that I have been working with, uh, yeah, like since starting um 2016 and um so with a friend of mine who's a programmer um vincent Febers, we created the software which actually changes the data i mean it's not changing this it actually uses like the raw data that comes from the device um but it visualizes it in a way as kind of i wanted it to be uh and to be seen i mean this project actually originated um as kind of first Kind of ideas um, as like almost like this kind of second skin and this brain race that I'm using right now in performances was initially as like just first stage of the project but kind of during kind of yeah the can work in progress I just realized that yeah it worked and it was quite interesting in its own and I kind of it's literally shifted the direction of uh, my project itself um, and so um, on the video, you can see, um, I don't know, like one of the screens um, as uh, which has this kind of almost like moving waves um, with uh, kind of cellular like uh, field uh, or like wave field in a way. This is actually um, something that corresponds to my EG data live during the performances. And it has, um, if you look at this kind of almost like plane, um, you can see something that the base is closer to you and then they go like further. It's just uh, they show different types of uh, brain waves. So I think it starts with the gamma, alpha, beta, um, theta or something. Yeah, so it's kind of, it reads, um, this device we say different types of brain waves and they kind of technically more active, they correspond to different states of brain activity. So like when you're consciously thinking about something and then when you sleep, it's um, like other, other, others would be like more active at that stage. And finally, in terms of the technology that you're using, drones, it's such a fantastic addition to your work and the sound that the drones create are really surprisingly emotive. How did you come to use drones within your work as collaborators and what are the benefits you find in working with them? Um, that's also, I mean, it's quite interesting, important, and at the same time, kind of um, quite a big question <laughs> in a way. Um, I think it's mainly came as kind of, yeah, just following, I guess, like logic of sense, because I was interested to work with um, kind of different type of technologies. I tried different things out, but uh, somehow drones, this kind of, I guess the agency they have, I mean, obviously, I'm not, I'm not trying to romanticize technology at all. And I understand, like, because obviously all technology comes from military um, kind of um, environment at first place. And it can be used, like, both, like, to kill and to heal in a way. Um, and kind of I'm reflecting on this as well, kind of ethics of technology as such. But uh, what I'm trying to do in my work is just perhaps to shift the way we can understand, interpret, and deal with technology, or like coexist with technology, or even co-evolve. Uh, kind of, yeah, I'm just referring to this kind of um, this movement of co-evolution in the book on um, kind of co-evolution as understanding kind of evolution of humanity, something that happens actually inseparably with the technological realm. Um, yeah, but just coming back to <laughs> kind of my work was drawn. So um, I guess I was 
quite fascinated by anyway any kind of aerial things and um, kind of this aspect of being in the air, kind of being in the space and kind of taking its space, but not literally marking it on the ground as we're kind of used to understanding of this kind of marking something just like point, putting those kind of almost nodal points and kind of defining your own space as space but with drones and something that is flying and same like I mean I look at kind of birds and birds cognition as part of my research but um, kind of obviously it's um, kind of di different aspects of it but it's kind of this notion of um, almost like breaking the boundaries and the boundaries we have and in relation to migration all those really complex and uh, kind of painful questions actually um, I mean I, I wouldn't go in that realm but they're all there and kind of even having something that kind of enables um, almost like disturbs those patterns and uh, kind of violates them and questions them uh, was interesting for me um, kind of yeah just like to try to engage with in my work and bring all those ups, ups, aspects that come with a specific type of technology as well um, and yeah just like decided to try to experiment to see how it will work and it was like a process of co-learning um, from each other in a way because obviously if you perform with something or with someone and for me it's kind of it's all performance and kind of it's living an entity because I look at different forms of intelligence and liveness in my work and um, kind of yeah I think just the way the drone itself behave uh, in the space and the kind of sonic presence it's create and um, kind of this uh, specific connection with technology and uh, taking care of it and knowing that you're responsible for it as well um, actually kind of shape shifted my work uh, quite a lot so it was like this almost like third technological element and more than just kind of element I would say it's like weird queer kind of friendship I would say <laughs> And it's kind of, yeah, I guess, like feeds into this um, kind of queer relationship with technology, queer relationship with digital. Um, and um, it's kind of when you start to understand it not as something that is for consumption, for use, or if you will give this some kind of agency that um, it literally changes the way you look at um, kind of almost like being in the world. I can go to more complex, I guess, like philosophical terms around it, but it's kind of, I hope it's kind of understandable for those um, quite basic, basic things and trying to describe. Absolutely. I mean, it's just, uh, it's just fascinating, this idea of the human and the non-human collaboration, you know, and even just that as a fundamental, as a starting point for collaborating with technology in this way. And then the idea of uh, kind of the queering relationships in the digital is fascinating. And I think that's, that's great for our viewers to get a bit of a sense of, you know, the basic nature of how that, how that kind of works and the thoughts behind your work. So thank you for that. It's just, there's so much to unpack in such a short time. Um, <laughs> so moving on a bit then, um, the video of your performance is filmed in 360 and you have a number of camera feeds displaying you, the drone and your brainwave data all at once. These multiple viewpoints enable you to create a kind of multi-dimensional space. And I love the way that the video changes and shifts its perception throughout. How does this add to the overall concept for the work and what you're hoping to convey to the audience through these multiple perspectives? I started to feel my performances in 360, actually when I started to work with the draw and I think it's like around two years ago um, from now, uh, but it also took time to actually understand what it was doing to the work because I was doing it as part of performance. So literally setting up the camera, turning it on and off became like part of those kind of rituals I have been doing during live performances. And actually its presence of, um, and the presence of the camera itself, it's almost like kind of I'm using uh, Fusion GoPro like 360 camera. So it looks like it's literally have this almost like surveillance element. Uh, if we're going back to kind of physical performances and I usually set it up at like almost like birds um, view so it's kind of looks at you and the audience and then when performances are filmed you have like this kind of um, notion of kind of always seeing something that is happening let's say like 
on earth <laughs> and um kind of when this whole thing had happened with uh, lockdown with pandemic and i still had some performances uh kind of planned some of them moved to uh, kind of actual digital online space uh and for me i faced this as like as live performance writers i faced this kind of almost like boundary or like a wall in the way how to deliver the multidimensionality of actual physical happening in the space because when you're in the space when you see physical performance it's kind of everything happens around you it's not just about what's happening on the stage so you can just frame it as single rectangle it's not about the performer actually it's about everyone who is in the space every member of the audience their breathing their kind of little noises they do it all adds to this kind of overall uh, kind of togetherness and being together in the space and creating this moment of performance and how you can actually um, change it and um, kind of I don't know break it into beats and actually deliver this kind of send, send it to the audience which is um, not present uh, with you in the same space you can't really see them during the performances even when I did performance on zoom I mean obviously still everyone's kind of remain quiet they're, they're looking at what is happening so you don't have this uh, kind of immediate feedback just through kind of seeing the audience, reading their gestures, responses, etc. But um, kind of, yeah, just for me, it was a question how to break this uh, flatness of the screen and how to kind of make it not as like one channel thing, but how to actually deliver this multiplicity of things that are happening during live performance, almost like molecular performativity. And um, Kind of so, so before kind of putting all those different feeds as one uh, kind of videos um, performance documentation, uh, I played with uh, multi camera, multi platform live streaming. So different parts, different views of the performance were going to different platforms, and the audience were advised to kind of yeah to choose whichever feeds they would like to see at the same time. They could stuck with one, they could have two. And which, in a way, this um, kind of choice and uh, multiplicity of possibility, when it's not just like given to you as like ready polished piece, um, it's actually to me, I think, it at least brings somehow this notion of co-creating of experience, and it gives uh, the audience this possibility of kind of making choice and decision, uh, like how they will perceive performance and what performance will become for them as it's kind of happening in the way in physical space because you can just like look at your phone, you can just do something else, turn away, just talk to your friend, whatever, just discuss some bits. So like, it's not actually what performer is actually just offering. It's kind of co-creating the things together with kind of being in the space and um, kind of, I guess, like putting those things back to the video um, actually in 3.6, just mapping them around this like sphere of actual like room, um, kind of edit as well the sense of um, kind of live liveness, I guess, to documentation itself. Because for me, it's also, it was another question, how do you work with um, kind of, I mean, live event, it's, it's happening when it's live and it's very authentic. And I, uh, no matter how you film it, you wouldn't get exactly the same feeling as when you're actually physically in the space. Uh, but in, and what what you do after, like with documentation, this kind of performativity and liveness of the archival, and uh, how it can come closer, but not in the same way. So like literally, like all those questions they come they were coming throughout my practice, and always I think in every performance artist practice. I really love the way in which in this performance, you know, the archival quality that you're talking about, I think is really important and integral for media artists, artists working with technology, because if it's not live performance, it's interactive sculpture, or it's some kind of immersive experience that the, the artist is trying to capture within their work. And it's really hard to figure out how do I then document that and send that, you know, and for people to understand what the performance is about or get a glimpse of it especially now because it's so challenging to be creating these live performances, you know, but without the audience being present, they're telepresent. And so, yeah, all these things are so, so super irrelevant and exciting to be exploring. Um, 
Do you think that um, you will take the even when real, real performance, performance with an audience presence is possible? Do you think that you will still carry some of these techniques through into your practice in the coming kind of months or years? Oh, yeah, I think definitely. I actually found this, I don't know, like it's, it's hard to say that uh, this period of time brought like a lot of kind of, it's hard to say it's like positive, negative changes, but it brought a lot of new patterns, new rituals to our lives. And there's definitely things that we have to think about and that we will take with us uh, for sure. Like I think it's in relation to every field, uh, every type of discipline. And uh, kind of also giving this possibility of um, kind of different level of accessibility of work itself. Let's say that if like, I think people who was joining performance they were joining like around the world. And uh, kind of, so you don't, uh, you're not bonded to like literally being on that specific space in that specific time. Yes, it's not the same. It's very different uh, kind of type of experience, but it also can be quite quality experience. And um, I think it's important to have this kind of openness and ability to share kind of, yeah, like knowledge, information and um, share art. So it's to make it, I mean, of course it's a question of accessibility. It's also questionable. So like obviously a person needs to have a laptop or like any kind of device to access it. Uh, they need to have an internet and uh, all the things come as a privilege for um, kind of, in relation to the majority of uh, population on um, earth and but still at least it kind of expands it uh, beyond just this like locality like almost like point if you bring in this kind of live, live streaming and kind of then afterwards like actually just streaming sessions um, and uh, yeah kind of to me it's, it's incredibly important because it's, it enables this um, possibility to connect with much wider audiences with much wider people just like hopefully uh, to enable every artist to send the message they have through their work um, they kind of trying to communicate through their work and through their practice to like other people who may need to actually receive this message at some point and it can be like this kind of shifting and changing moment not for everyone but uh, kind of and not in the same degree but um, like yeah like for some people for sure <laughs> So I'm going to round off with my final question, which I'm going to ask all the performers this evening, because um, Art in Flux, we always create events and exhibitions for artists working with technology. And we feel that live performance is really integral to the media art discourse. And so we, we often curate performance evenings as well. And I just wondered if you had any final thoughts about why live performance is the medium of your choosing and how it allows you to connect with a contemporary audience. I think once you try to do live performance, it's really hard to come back to any other mediums <laughs> in a way because it gives you very special level, like almost like buzzing intensity. And when you're kind of making something live, it feels like in a way the most generous medium we can work with uh, because you really have to be kind of yeah, like open, honest, and very generous because like the, I, I would say not in terms of you know, like literally like making something, but you're transmitting a lot of energy as well. And you're sharing this with the audience and then you receive some uh, something back too. And that is very um, kind of yeah, like special type of relationship with the audience. Thank you so much, Anna, for sharing your amazing work with us. It's been such a pleasure to have you on the show. So now we're going to move on to our second performer, moving from an artist working with human and machine collaboration to an artist that combines analog and digital realms together to create his pieces. Mowgli is a transmedia artist and performer with an interest in sustainability, repurposing and the intersection between art and technology. His work, which combines questions of perception, consciousness, and our role in the universe, often looks at emerging and obsolete technologies within found objects to create new and unforeseen experiences. From audiovisual live shows at the British Film Institute Southbank to award-winning interactive installations for Burning Man, light art for the VNA, and pilot programs for the BBC, his solo and collaborative work spans the senses and creative disciplines. He is currently co-director of VJ London and resident VJ for Crux AV. Tonight, Mowgli will present Eye of the Beholder. 
Eye of the Beholder is an improvised audio-visual performance. All the audio is hardware generated with mostly analogue devices, while the videos are real-time generative compositions that are manipulated live. The piece explores the interactions between audio and visual cycles from a fractal perspective, striving to create a trance-like state in the viewer. Due to its improvisational nature, the performance is always tailored to the space and time, making it site-specific. Eye of the Beholder was premiered at Shambhala Festival 2019 and has been performed at events and exhibitions including Mars and Beyond, which was featured in Forbes and Crux AV. Mowgli's performance will last 15 minutes, after which there'll be a 20-minute interview between the artist and myself. If you have any questions for Mowgli, please do feel free to write them in the YouTube chat and he will respond to them live. Take it away for us, Mowgli.
Thanks so much for joining us, Mowgli. Of course, I know your work really well. And I also know that your first job after leaving school was actually being a DJ in a club, which is very cool. But can you tell us about how you first started working with performance and technology? Uh, well, it was all a bit of an accident. I first started uh, getting involved with performance and technology uh, being a, a VJ that was providing live visuals for a post-rock band called The Twish, uh, which were friends of mine. And uh, it was, as I said, it was a complete accident. I went to see them play. And then I was having a chat with them after after the gig and they were saying, oh, so how did you find it? And I, I was really honest and I said, oh, I thought the music was great, but there's definitely something you need to do about your stage presence. There is nothing to look at. You, sh you could do it with some visuals or, or something happening. And the reply was, you do it. So that was the beginning. I wonder if you have any formal training in music and composition or if you're self-taught. How did you get into creating your music and what has inspired you along the way? Uh, well, I mean, as, as you've mentioned earlier, my first job straight out of school was, was DJing. So, uh, I, I mean, I, I tried to play the guitar when I was a kid at some point and maybe they recorded it when I was at school, but I wouldn't count that as anything that really marked or anything I learned anything from. So all my, all my music experience comes from DJing more than anything else and seeing uh, what works and what doesn't work in a in a dance floor or in a club or at a party and how people react to it. So that's that's where I come from. But uh, the way I've started uh, getting involved in music has been more to do coming from a sound perspective and a music perspective. Uh, I mean, the difference between both is probably non-existent to a lot of people. But I think the approach I take is is different. I'm more interested in frequencies and and the reaction of that frequencies to your body than whether there's a scale going on or whether this is in tune or not. Uh, I quite like certain things to be out of tune sometimes. I quite like a bit of bizarreness thrown in the, in, in, in the soup with everything else. Uh, and uh, I think yeah, my approach is not musical at all. It's more, it's more from a sound perspective. I wonder if you can tell us why you choose to create work live and unplanned rather than having things pre-recorded. What are the benefits to you in working this way? Well, for me, the, the artistic expression comes from the moment. Uh, I don't, I mean, I, I don't really enjoy editing audio at all. Uh, I, I tend to, whenever I create a track, it tends to be like a, a like straight cut from a recording. So I'll, I'll do several takes and I'll just pick the best one and maybe enhance it a bit with EQ and whatever. But I try to avoid editing as much as possible. I like improvisation because it's very immediate and uh, it gives me probably not the same feeling, but a very similar feeling to the audience while listening to it because I don't know what's gonna happen. I get as surprised as everybody else. Uh, I mean, the, the way I work is I try to construct some kind of system that will allow me to change things dramatically very quickly or do a slow progression towards something but with actually having complete control over what's going to happen and i really enjoy when when i i get properly surprised sometimes you know you're gonna like okay one two three four and there's going to be a radical change here but i don't know what that radical change is going to be all i know is that there's going to be a change and when i do it sometimes it's good sometimes it's not that good but when it's really good i get that kind of energy that drives me and that's and that's what i enjoy about performing is the here and now it's like things can go wrong it's the tension and it's the audience reaction as well uh i think not knowing what's gonna happen makes me react as the audience does whether it's surprise or shock or, or whatever it might be and i i, I really I re i'm really driven by that Sounds like a really liberating way to work and the fact that the audience and you are both sharing a kind of unique experience at the same time is really groundbreaking, I think. So in terms of your audio, in your performance, it's all generated using analogue devices. I was wondering if you could tell us a bit about the technology and the different kinds of modules that you're using and how they come together to create your own kind of unique audio style. Uh, well, first, I'd like to say it's not all strictly analog. Some people are a bit too finicky about these things. Uh, uh, I would call it 90% analog, and it tends to be mostly hardware-based. I have used computers sometimes. I still use them sometimes for the audio, but I do try to, to step away from the computer 
completely like uh, the system I use keeps changing uh, uh, which is I mean, it's also one of the reasons why I like the whole uh, improvised side of things is the the hardware that I'm using for my performances changes from performance from uh, to performance and from day to day uh, I keep adding new things uh, a few months ago I started my journey into modular synthesis after using like small uh, units like all the Volkers, uh, Volker Kick, uh, Volker Beats, uh, Volker Modular. But uh, slowly I've, I've realized that I've been, without knowing it, walking towards the like modular synthesis approach. So I've started building one. I've got a, a Moog DFAM, which is the, the hub of my system at the moment. And it's growing very slowly. So uh, I couldn't really get into details of what will be there in the near future. I mean, at the moment, I've got the DFAM that I've mentioned. Uh, I've got uh, this other module, which basically is, uh, is like a, it's a sequencer more than anything else, but it allows me to to play with the sequence within the DFAM a lot more than with the built-in features. Uh, I've got some delays and I'm slowly kind of like progressing through that and building my own modules, but uh, there's no clear direction at the moment. I mean, I'm experimenting a lot. My, my approach is mainly experimental. So uh, I guess my wig will, will grow in a very experimental manner as I progress. And for those of us that maybe don't know so much about the exact types of analog synths and things that you're mentioning, can you kind of explain um, how how the sound how these kind of modules come together to build the sound the theory is very simple the practice looks extremely complicated uh basically modular synthesis is is modules so you have different kinds of modules uh like the most basic one being probably an oscillator which will create a sound through oscillation and then you can pipe that uh that sound through to other modules that may be effects uh reverb a delay or whatever uh, but at the same time that module has uh, inputs that are controlled through voltages so a lot of modules all they do is they sell they, they sell what's called control voltages which are basically just a uh, varying voltage which could be like a like a trigger so it's just like on and off like a binary trigger or it could be like a low frequency oscillation so it keeps fluctuating from the maximum voltage to the minimum voltage and you can use all these voltages to control the, the oscillator, whether, it, whether it's the pitch of it or depending on the oscillator. I mean, you could do like kind of frequency modulation using another oscillator. But basically, it's just like loads, loads of electricity flowing, which is controlling and triggering different things. And often it's controlling itself through a weird loop. And uh, the outcome of it is... Uh, it can be very, very unpredictable, very surprising in a, in a, in a good way. And uh, it kind of gives the hardware the feeling of it being alive. So rather than you dictating what the hardware is doing, you're more kind of just guiding it a bit and pointing it to different directions, but the hardware has a lot to say. That's fascinating. So now I'd love to talk to you about your animated visuals. So the, the animated visuals that you use within the piece are generated real time and are created to explore the fractal connections between the audio and the visual. Can you tell me about the connections between the audio and visuals and what kind of state you're trying to evoke within the viewer? Well, I mean, my, my approach for this, this performance uh, comes uh, very much from like uh, loop based audio, uh, but they're loops that keep evolving. So, it's, that's, that's why I, I, I bring in the, the fractal analogy. Uh, it's basically like a series of steps which are repeated ad infinitum, ad infinitum but there's, there's a small evolution in, in each one of these cycles. So both the audio and the visuals work in, this, in the same way. You could start off with a, with a cycle which could be like four beats long or like 16 beats long. Uh, and you progress it over time. And uh, I'm really interested in seeing how, how this evolution translates as, a, as an audiovisual stimuli. As in, if you're looking at the visuals and you're hearing the music at the same time, there's clearly a time-based correlation between them. Uh, there could be an emotional correlation as well, uh, which is obviously like harder to implement on purpose. Uh, I've worked a lot with uh, trying to, to find out the correlations between uh, audio and video in terms of whether uh, pitch relates to color in a way that humans can relate to from an emotional perspective rather than a purely scientific perspective. Uh, because it's very easy to 
to, let's say, take whatever, like a 440 hertz frequency and find the equivalent frequency and color and play with that. But whether that actually works for a human as, a, as two different stimuli that I want is a different matter. Uh, so I found that the best way to work them together is, is, through, is through the cyclical nature of cycles and how they evolve. And that's my approach to it. Uh, in a way, you can catch a snippet of my performance and in a way it encapsulates the whole of the performance in a way that a fractal, that a fractal does. So that's, that's, that's my approach to, to mixing these two things together. I uh, don't know if you asked about how the visuals are also uh, created uh, on top of what the, what the link is between audio and video. The, the visuals are currently, I create them all in, uh, in Resolu Marina, which is the software made specifically for VJing, which handles uh, video and generative content of different kinds. Uh, the moment I'm using purely the, the generative tools that come built into the software, which uh, are kind of basic, but the approach in the software is very much a modular thing, the same as the, as the, as the audio. So uh, from simple seeds, like a triangle or a square or a circle, whatever that might be, you can create quite a lot of complicated things just through repetition, uh, translations, uh, faking 3D motion in space, all this kind of stuff. And it's very easy to work with the visuals and the audio in that way because you've got different elements, either a triangle, a dot, a line, whatever, which come to represent even like maybe certain, like let's call them instruments within the music. There's no instruments, it's all electronic, but they, I do tend to go for synthesized sounds that remind us of naturally occurring instruments quite a lot of the time. So there's a lot of percussive sounds, uh, a lot of like ethnic sounding uh, like string instruments and woodwinds and all this kind of stuff. Uh, but yeah, I find that the correlation between audio and, and visual works best when it's based on like a definite kind of objects in the visual realm and define objects in the auditory realm. So like shape, tends to be the linking between both. Can you talk about the technology that you use to create your animations and how you manipulate the clips live and overlay them to create an ever-changing feast for the eyes? Basically, when, I, when, I'm, when I'm working with AV, I tend to have like a hub that controls everything. In uh, the case of the Eye of the Beholder, it's a, it's a script that's got like three channels of sequencing, basically. And uh, the sequencer, spits out both uh, control voltage that I mentioned before is what controls all the modular synth uh, stuff. And there's MIDI, which is what's being sent to the laptop that's controlling the visuals. So from one surface, I can actually interact with both things at the same time as a whole. So while I'm performing, there is no, oh, I'm gonna do this in the music and then I'm gonna do this in the visuals. Everything is tied together in very complicated ways. I mean, there's, there's some simple, things as in if I trigger this button it's going to trigger this visual and it's going to make this sound which is quite straightforward but there's other cases where there's like the velocity that's used to trigger a note the velocity is how loud that note's going to be it's actually also used to open and close a parameter within the visuals let's say for example the size of a circle uh, but again, this can be very, it can get very complicated because there's layers and layers and layers of this data moving around within the sequencer and being thrown around into the modular synth and, uh, uh, and the, the, the visual software. So it, it can get pretty complicated. I mean, I work in a very linear way where I'm building this systems up as in I literally have an idea and I just configure it all, trying to remember what I'm trying to do and get to the end. And then once that's done, I know that using this control surface is going to have an effect and that I've thought it out and that is good. So that really goes back to, again to the improvised nature of the performance and how in the first instance you do spend the time to um, figure out a system that makes sense when you're when you're organizing it and then it, that allows you the freedom and the sort of liberty to then really express yourself throughout the performance. No, no, I mean, the, the, way, the way I look at this is I, I build instruments. Like the configuration of my audio and video gear becomes an instrument. 
and uh, the instrument keeps evolving and it keeps changing but i always look at it as an instrument it's something that's very tactile that's very immediate that you can just start doing whatever it is straight away with no thought process like it's literally as you pick up a whistle and you blow on it and there you go it's it's going so that's 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 the way i, I like to i like to configure these things so it's as immediate as possible your visuals have a kind of almost tribal feel to them and i know that you mentioned percussive instruments um, and kind of ethnic string instruments and things like that and i wondered how you come up with these bold and colorful designs in terms of the animations and what inspires you to create them well i mean the the, the overall style is very much again coming from from like kind of the fractal analogy where like a set of really simple rules will create something very complicated uh, at the same time uh, coming back from like sort of my dj background i've always been very influenced by by trance and tribal kind of music uh, whether whether it's real percussion uh, like african drumming drum circles this kind of stuff or whether it's the evolution of that that i see nowadays with what's becoming liquid house and this kind of uh, slower tempo up to like about like 96 BPM, uh, very tribal influenced. And this, this a big kind of shamanic influence there. I'm very much influenced by psychedelic experience, uh, shamanistic rituals and, and the, the, the connection between the spirit realm and the music and visuals. So that I can see, I mean, there's a lot of, uh, I don't know, like Celtic pattern influences, uh, uh, sacred geometry, uh, Islamic geometry, all these kind of things are very, very like latent in my work. I've been asking all the performers this evening this question. Art in Flux have always created events that feature live performance as we feel it is integral to the media art discourse. And I wondered if you had any final thoughts about why live performance is the medium of your choosing and how it allows you to connect with a contemporary audience. I would put live performance above any other form of expression personally because uh, you get a true synergy with the audience there and then. So now, from Mowgli, who combines audio and visual from a fractal perspective, to Mark Pilkington, who combines the two same things, but to explore real and digital environments. Mark's artistic practice forges immaterial and creative labour through a network of interwoven and augmented territories. His work increasingly queries the way technology carries great critical and creative potential. He received a PhD in music from the University of Manchester and composed music using multi-channel sound, sonification and data visualisation at the Novars Research Centre. He is currently researching and performing audiovisual compositions with Dr Oliver Carman at the University of Liverpool. His music has been performed and screened internationally at ICMC, Ars Electronica, ZKM, Mantis Festival and the Open Circuit Festival. Tonight, Mark will present two audiovisual works, Bug Data and Synergies. We will begin with Bug Data, which will last approximately eight minutes, after which we will air Synergies. Bug Data is an audiovisual composition that reflects the impact of damming on waterways by studying the migration and displacement of non human species. It's achieved by combining the creative application of data visualization and sonification to form an audiovisual composition. The aim of the piece is to provide a voice to unseen creatures that live in our waterways through the translation of scientific research into music.
Synergies is a collaborative work by Dr. Mark Pilkington, Thought Universe, and Dr. Oliver Carman, University of Liverpool, that investigates the integration of sound and images in the composition of electroacoustic music. Using code to form an animated graphic score to represent sounds derived from the human voice. Mark's final work, Synergies, will last approximately six minutes, after which there'll be a 20-minute artist interview between the artist and myself. If you have any questions for Mark, please do feel free to write them in the YouTube chat and he will respond to them live.
It's really great to have been able to showcase two of your pieces for this evening's event, Bug Data and Synergies. They both feel connected to one another, but they're also really individual works in their own right. I'm going to focus, focus on Bug Data first, as this was the first piece that we presented, and then I'll move on to talking a bit more about Synergies. So in terms of Bug Data, you reflect on the impact of damming on waterways by studying the migration and displacement of non-human species. Can you talk us through how you translate the tr scientific research through data visualization to create your unique audiovisual compositions? Yes, um, yeah, bug data um, is done in conjunction with the Center for Hydrology and Ecology uh, from, from, a, from a, a colleague of mine called Francois Edwards. Um, and, and he supplied this data because obviously it's a data driven piece uh, I needed access to some sort of data. I can give you some outlines of the background of how that came about. I did an, originally did a piece called Lamalord, which was uh, examining the acoustics of, 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 of dams in the Peak District in the UK. And I just made this piece and then I saw this I uh, came across an email for a conference about future dams and I was like, future dams? Well, Lama Lord should be able to fit into that as an artistic piece within a scientific context. And I uh, just, the first person I spoke to turned out to be Francois Edwards and we've sort of kept in touch for a number of years from that. Um, so Lama Lord was um, a multi-screen piece that uses uh, uh, an ambisonic recording of the inside of the dam of, of me performing the concrete dam uh, in, in the middle of the Peak District. Um, and then <clears throat> when I explained this to Francois, he was scratching his head, he just could not understand what it was coming from. And, you know, uh, and, and then when, when we start to have more conversations and dialogue, uh, then we, he suggested about, I, I was looking for ideas for a new piece and he suggested about um, studying uh, the distribution of macroinvertebrates in streams in the northwest of England, predominantly in the, in the later. The, the pieces uh, um, from the Future Dams Conference, um, th there's, there's the impact of damming has on, on, on cultures around the world. And this is a part of uh, Francois' research. And, and I sort of, um, tapped into this as far as the, the, the topical ideas of, um, you know, borders and, and things like that we're all hearing about every day and closing down opening borders and, and equated this to um, the species other than human and this time being macroinvertebrates. So it basically gave me this data, which is a, a CSV file of uh, the samples from 20 years ago on, on, the, on the river Lauda. And each sample is, um, uh, just uh, to recap, but what hydrologists do to test the freshness of water is to measure the macroinvertebrate uh, creatures within the water. And that shows you how the water is doing, regardless, you know, and it's one of the, the most uh, preferred ways of, of measuring water quality. And um, so I, I was given this data of sample points, but also with a dam, that's what they call an abstraction within the river. And then the bugs, uh, we'll call them bugs. Uh, how they um, 
um, how they go through the dam, how they get round it, things like that, and which ones get through and which ones don't get through. So it's a comparison in a way of a table. Um, so yeah, so the table is then is analysed uh, um, as uh, a piece of data and then displayed on the screen, uh, and this can be displayed as a simple bar graph depending on the number you can map that to a certain coordinate on the screen for each different species but but, but obviously you know that and you can you can you can that's a very scientific way of representing it. obviously i wanted to do my own interpretation of this thing because you know science is always up to question you know and i think art, art and the meld two together as um is really interesting because it gives you this sort of dialogue another direction to think about things probably um, so I started to map the map it to sounds, the, the data, and map it to visuals. Yeah. You mentioned about how the sort of you're mapping the sounds and they're related to the data. And I understand that each of the kind of sounds within the piece are related to the 112 species of these um, invertebrates that you're talking about. But all the sounds are developed using synthesis, so sound synthesis, so that, so that I can control and shape the sounds uh, electronically, and these can be done on analog synthesizers or digital synthesizers, a mixture of both. And you're making a collage, almost like a, a sound piece that is indicated each zone of that sound piece is related to a, to a typology of these, um, these bugs. Because if you look at the bugs, um, they, they form a, um, a typologies like groups, like some of them have legs, some have little um, uh, these you know other other characteristic shells some have shells some are worm anatode sort of shapes so as i'm looking at these images as well um you start to think about how the sounds would sound if you could if you could microscopically listen to a to a crawly thing in the water or, or a worm and you start to have like this idea of uh, relating to the sounds that we produce with our with our um, with our um, uh, with our own vocal tracks and things like that and, and shaping the sound of synthesizer until you hit on that point and then it's like all right that's the that's a nanotode or this is like a buggy sort of sound or you could have a stick insect that's quite brittle or clicky things like that so it's building up these typologies but what happens eventually is the typologies merge they start to form structure they have a spec like a, a they go from one point to another but then they also overlap and create these like morphological structures you know. that's hence the sort of electroacoustic influence, influence with, it, with the piece. As well as using technological devices to create your work there are also elements of hand-drawn sketches used throughout the piece. Can you tell us about those elements and how they feed into the piece as a whole? I feel like the sketch is a very powerful thing to do just to sit down and just draw freely and, and just whatever ideas are in your head, it becomes very expressive and embedding those into the code, into these, these, these sort of meta, like as meta models or, and just pulling stuff out of it, you know, like trying to sort of um, expand the image. I'm also a strong advocate for sustainable practice and contribute myself to the climate movement. I was really drawn to a line on your website that stated, as the earth faces rapid climate change, it's imperative that a re-evaluation of art and science takes place in order to better communicate ecological concerns. I wondered if you could expand upon this notion and talk about how technology has enabled you to produce, produce such a profound piece and give these unseen creatures a voice. Yeah, um, as I, I would sort of say, yes, uh, ecological concerns have crept into my work um and it, it's a it's a great format a great platform to be able to express these concerns and my, my influences are coming from sort of philosophy to, from people like Bruno Latour and, and the ideas around the Anthropocene and and um and also Lynn Markless uh, looking at her work as, as as a symbiotic um environment to do with the earth so how, how do you how do you represent the, these these large scientific concepts you know how, how so using art th there's a way to sort of again communicate these ideas with data visualization it's kind of like artist as translator but also art in, artists in general being able to create these spaces that allow 
the public and the artists and the scientists to all be having these conversations and to kind of raise awareness of these issues and start kind of thinking about what alternative and possible futures might be like. Um, because obviously this is such an important and pressing issues, you know, that we need to be starting to tackle in our own way. And I think art is a really poignant and the perfect place for that, for experimentation and for not being afraid of kind of testing the water and seeing what what might be possible you know for the future yeah i mean and i think it's always gone on if you look at like the cave paintings it's all like they're all sort of signposts of survival you know that they're like the sort of bison on the paint on the side of the cave wall it's like look, look this is where they are you can you know we can survive or we can make this this is how you instructions to do this or diaries and, and um you know like hieroglyphics and things like that they tell stories that, that you know um, now the meaning of these stories is is always up for question. You know, they're always translated as history. History is always seems to be trans transformed all the time. It's never fair. So um, it never, it, yeah. So yeah, yeah. It's um, yeah. You can act as a translation, but also create this debate for alter for, for for consensus for ideas of like right. Let's agree on this and let's try and find a way forward. And it's not always through like having a result. You know, it's something that takes time to sort of being digested into society. You know, think it's like certain things just suddenly pop up in society for no apparent reason at all. You know, out of any sort of marketing campaign or any sort of like control, some some of these ideas are taken on, and um, you know, positive ideas, positive ideas is to change and things like. That. It's been fascinating to talk to you about bug data. I'm going to move us through into speaking a bit more about Synergies now, which is a collaboration between yourself and Dr. Oliver Carmen. Can I ask you how the collaboration between you both came about? Yeah, uh, well, I've known Oliver or, or Ollie for, for quite a number of years because we, we did a PhD for, at Manchester University in electroacoustic competition. Um, and so we, we knew of each other's work. And then um, they he started this his job at Liverpool and there was a competition or not competition but a festival uh, for a work for A B work so I put one of my works in and he liked it very much and that was it really it's pretty much uh, you know we we sort of, we drew in a you know and I liked the work that he'd been doing with with the way that he manipulates sound and so each year there was a commission a festival part called the Open Circuit Festival. And we've worked it up basically over the last three or four years to where we are now, um, working together. In in this case with synergies, um, I'm just concentrating on doing the visuals, which is quite a relief because doing audio visual stuff can be quite demanding because you can spend months and months on the audio and then months and months on the visuals and then back again. And it, 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 it it's good to have somebody like Oliver um, contributing the audio to be coming together. And, 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 and I do like the idea, the idea of collaboration. I think that like, obviously there are like a rich area for, for people to sort of investigate, you know, work together with people that they don't necessarily know, you know, and that the dialogue happens through the work. I wondered if I could ask you a little bit more about, um, I think within the piece you can hear that there are sounds that are recorded from the human voice. Mm -hmm. And I know that you mentioned that you're predominantly working on the visuals and that Oliver is more to do with the sound. And yeah. the production of that but can you talk us a little bit about how the sounds are created or how they're compositionally arranged throughout the piece yeah obviously they're all of the sounds so i can only sort of speak so much about them really but i'll try my best i mean the, the um with, with that with the synergies piece it started out with uh, i showed him some sketches you know we, we had a coffee once and i showed him this sketchbook i just happened to have it in my bag and and uh, oh, these are these are interesting, and it seems to be like there's a form of a human form in there. So, and then he said, oh, I've actually fancied working with vocal sounds for a while, you know. So he he would actually sort of record himself sat in the car, like just making all these squeaky noises and, and you know just vocal utterances for a better want for a better word. And then and then these these recordings, you know, regardless of the format, I'm not saying you record them on his phone or. or and any recordable device that was to hand, then they will go through a process of um, using programs like Cecilia, which is a really an open source software um, uh, 
based on C sound, which is a really powerful synthesis language that sort of it's not unknown, but it, it's it's not the main um, you know the main forerunner. Of, uh, but it, it's it's so fle it's so flexible what you can do. So so you can put a sound in there and stretch out you know like stretch time stretch sounds out. So they become like or and you and you have this lot of sort of development. And then you can bl you can obliterate the sound and granulate the sounds into like all this sort of thing. And the, and this idea that there's a, there's a really great composer uh, called Trevor Wishart who does these vocal improvisations. And when he's doing all these programming for his sound material, if he can if he can replicate it with his mouth as a as an as a gesture as, as an articulation, then he's halfway there. He just needs to get the computer to match the sort of sound material. So the, the voice is a really flexible instrument. You know, it's, we're so familiar with the sounds of our own voice. You know, the clicks, the pops, the sibilance, all that sort of thing. And we always tend to be focusing on the word, you know, the, the meaning of the language, the language, you know, the, ling the linguistics. But there's all this other stuff going on as well that people just forget to hear. And, and I think with Oliver, I think he's done a great job of like bringing that out. The human voice really makes a piece relational to the audience because you can you can hear those elements of sounds that you can make yourself and you've got this kind of again it's the bringing of the natural and the the natural the human and the sort of technological together to create this composition and placing because it's a human voice it sort of places the audience directly into the into the center of the performance piece i think yeah um, so, of course, the the thing that you're you're working on in this in this performance is more the the graphics. So, I wondered in the visuals. Can you tell us a bit more about the visual elements? So, are they coming again from your draw some of your sketches and your drawings, and how how are they kind of changed and manipulated throughout the piece? Yeah, um, yeah, it's it's all from one sketch in a way. Um, so. You know the idea think you take a single source and expand it as far as it can possibly go um in fact i've got i'm, I'm just in the process of writing it up so it will be on the website about the visuals and how and how they, they came about so the sketch um so with this uh, with this simple sketch it's then made it's made into an animation and then this animation is was sent to Oliver for him to map the sounds to. So he would he would use it as like a visual score. And obviously with a computer you can just accurately drop everything on a single frame and totally synchronize everything if you want to do, or you can expand around it. It's easy to synchronize everything with uh, with a computer. You know, you can you can call up a number and it happens then. And and that's great. But as the piece developed, there's, there's also this sense of like space around the, the discrete number, you know. So uh, as the sketch becomes more and more abstracted, even though the sketch was quite abstract, and I have a tendency to work on idea of architectural form within within the work, and then implant people or characters, like, like an architect would, you know, when you put the little figures in to give you a sense of scale. So there's actually two, there's a there's an image of two um, two female characters or people in the actual image. You, you can't see that in, within images. So there's this meeting of these two people together within this sort of like construction, you know. Um, and um, so that that was the original sketch. It's like a one color scheme. It's like some sort of like one of those uh, pen, uh, um, you know, like a, a purpley color. And um, and then that's it. And then the drawings and the little marks and, and all this sort of thing and the, and the detail. So then it's put it within the computer. Now, what I do with, with the, once I've got a sound initiated from Oliver, is I, I map that to the screen, to the sides of the screen, so that the sound goes across like this to the entire piece of the screen. Now, in that in that as it's going along, it's like similar to a piece of uh, digital audio workstation. You have a timeline that goes across. So you, I can plot onto the timeline when this event happens and it sort of expands out and then it goes back down again as the whole thing is moving in this type of sort of direction. And I work from a sort of very uh, methodical process. It takes a lot of time because you have to build everything so that you have this framework that, that's balanced as well. Like I could have a big shape here and then I have to sort of shrink it down. 
to reflect the density of the sounds and the properties of the sounds. Um, so there's a lot of listening involved. There's a lot of this like, sort of like three, you know, like idea of listening to things perceptually and like listening to things that give you, you know, fire your imagination to, to do something, you know, as well as these trajectory lines and the things happening off that. Um, and it just keeps going and I share the work with him um, and then he, he comments on it, like you say, well, this is a little bit busy here because it's when you work on your own, it's, it's easy just to sort of like pile everything in, you know, and it's time of working with the piece that you suddenly start to reduce things, like you'll cut out large chunks, you know, even though you spent months working on a section, uh, you'll cut it out just to, to benefit the rest of the, for the, almost like an ecosystem, back to this idea of ecosystems again, this is, you know, um, relates to, to the uh, ecology of the piece as well. Um, so yeah, so the, these dynamic processes are programmed in. So if, if at a certain point this happens, and there's generative processes in there, um, you know, that, that that measures itself as it as it sort of like start to expand. And there's also a so there's different. It's, there's a process of analysis and then creation and. Another form of analysis is what they call fast Fourier transformation, which is a spectral way of looking at sounds, which is embedded onto some of the lines. You'll see some of the lines like flickering. They're not they're not animated frame by frame animation. They're just reactions, sound reactions um, to, to the sound. Um, and because I'm I'm quite, um, I think. As, as far as technology goes, I'm quite opposed to this idea that fast is better. You know, and what I, with the method I work, and I use processing to do my visuals, so it could be any sort of code, you know, is this idea of efficiency, and this again relates to the ecosystem, in a way, making something efficient, so you program it specifically for, for your machine, and my machines aren't, they're not the latest machines, you know, and, and the idea is that I can make it um, accessible when it's coded, portable, so I've done concerts where I've just turned up, turned up with um, like a USB stick. That's it. And just plug it into their computer. You know, let, let them buy the computers. Just just make the piece, and then you know it, it's it's platform um, cross platform as well as the software. So it works. You know, it's not fixed to one um, a licensing agreement or things like that. So so anyway, but but. So that, that's my preferred way, way of working, but it's very methodical. It takes a lot of time to build it up. And once you get the balance of the equilibrium right, it's like, it's, it's, uh, you can tell it starts to work. And also another aspect is the uh, interaction. So you can interact with the score and it's like a map. So you can see if you click here and click there, this, these events will happen. I've been asking each performer to reflect upon the nature of live performance and why it is the medium that you're choosing to work with and how it allows you to connect with an audience. And I wondered if you had any last final thoughts about that. Um, well, it's like a direct connection. It's like plugging straight into the, the real, you know, it's, it's sort of like, um, you just, if, you, if you're on stage, there's no escaping that you're there. I mean, you can turn the lights down, but there's still the presence of somebody there, even if you have full lights and full visuals and stuff like that. And I think it says so much more than, than, than words can actually sort of portray about a piece. You know, it's not all about being too academic about it, you know. And the less academic you are in the performance, the, the, the seems to be, you know, you, get, you can get a better result. You know, you end up feeling connected to the work in a different way you know there's a liveness that go you know it starts and you've got this you've got to be really uh, honed in and concentrate on, on, the, on the on the shape in the piece be it the sounds or the visuals so there's this sort of urgency and, and adrenaline that you get which is like life affirming sort of um, processes yeah <laughs> a huge thank you to our performers for their groundbreaking audiovisual performances. I'm sure you'll all agree that tonight's performance evening has been an entertaining and insightful one. Over the course of this evening, we have provided key insights into how a live performance and time-based practice can be a thrilling medium for media artists, and also one 
that engages with the audience in new and exciting ways. I will now hand over to my colleagues Maria Almina and Oliver Gingrick, who will tell you a little bit more about our next events. Thank you very much, Afra. Yeah, so um, our next uh, Flex Social is already coming up in a couple of weeks' time, and we would love for you to be part of it. Um, the next Flex Social is called Publix, and I will be taking the lead in hosting it. Um, and it will all be around the theme of participatory art firms, the changing role of public, of the public and different publics um, in artistic production. Big thanks to all the featured artists and to Afra for putting together such an inspirational event. I would love to invite you all to our next uh, Flux Live, which is going to be um, feature our, the Arts Electronica online um, festival. We uh, have been invited um, to be part of the UK Garden, and we are really, really excited to be, um, be featured at this festival. We are going to be doing a live event featuring the work of uh, the three founders of Flux, as well as an online exhibition. The live event is going to be on the 11th of September and the online exhibition, it will be uh, online for the duration of the Arts Electronica Festival. So we would love to uh, see you there and have your support for this very exciting opportunity for FLAX. So uh, yeah, we'll be sharing the links for the tickets and information um, in our social media and through our newsletter. So thank you. Thank you, Maria and Oliver. We do hope that some of you will join us for our next events. So now I would just like to say thanks so much once again to our performers, Anna, Mowgli and Mark, for their incredible contributions to tonight's event. And of course to the audience, thank you so much for joining us. Good night. <laughs>